Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Open Translation Lounge at TED Global 2013. So today we're actually happy to welcome Teddy Cruz, who just left the TED stage moments ago um, and presented a pretty bold way of, of designing, planning, and building our cities in the future, which we're going to talk about at length today. Um, here in uh, the lounge today, we have Bryant from uh, China, um, Urteza from uh, Pakistan, Jan from Czechoslovakia, and Unawut from uh, Thailand. And on Skype, welcome to all of you. Um, Teddy, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Um, so just, I, it's funny, when people talk about planning new cities, they always think of looking at these big, giant, bold, you know, Shanghai, Dubai. Why, why don't you look to those cities as, a, as, as an inspiration, for instance? Oh, Obviously. gosh, you, you begin right away with a... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that after, again, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, that after the last years of investment in those environments, as, as the architecture and planning and urban intelligentsia from all over the world fled in mass to those environments, and that explosion, again, of urbanization from Dubai to Shanghai to, you know, many of these enclaves of economic power, I don't think, and maybe you guys can tell me, but I just don't see one single idea that emerge from those transformations. In reality, the best ideas about urbanization in the context of generating other modalities of planning, of rethinking infrastructure, of affordable housing, of, of mobilizing other processes of public participation, and so on were happening in Latin America, but nobody was noticing. Sure. So the provocation that I have is that not one single idea was advanced in Dubai, or Shanghai, in fact, they were just imitating and reproducing the worst recipes of urban planning uh, that were generated in the United States in the last decades. I'm actually wondering what your strategy would be if, let's say, we were to transplant you and say, could we take some of these strategies and, and do them in mm. these different countries? Say, you know, when you have this kind of authoritarian capitalism, how could you, yes. how could you deal with this? I, I've worked, in fact, in, in South Korea uh, as an artist intervening in projects that have to do with public space and the politics of housing. And I investigated many of those neighborhoods that were slated for demolition. And it was amazing to investigate the amount of informal economies of social organizational practices embedded in those neighborhoods. There was a man who built a snail farm on four rooftops of his block. Wow. And in doing so, he also produced a cooperative model to sustain the economy of that immediate uh, environment. Uh, and it's sad to imagine that those entrepreneurial socioeconomic energies are completely eroded. Right. Fine, we know that the city needs to transform, so I'm not talking about preserving those neighborhoods intact, but before we destroy them, let's understand what they have produced. Sure, right. And right. what I've been investigating in my own section of the world at the border between Mexico and the United States is that density needs to be reimagined as an amount of socioeconomic exchanges per area. And that's what defines many of those neighborhoods. But that's, that's something that's uh, not, it's not, if a developer looks at it, they can't monetize that. So how do you sell that to the, the power brokers or the stakeholders in the community who are actually ex driving everything? How do, how do you come in as a designer and say, it's, it's like really complicated, right? I, you know, I, as we all know, the role of the architect and designers, it's been eroded to some degree, but you, when you're dealing with a massive problem, I'm just wondering what your strategy is for tackling it. That's a fantastic question. I, I, I think that that's where we begin to find and expand the role of, for architects and planners that can begin to act as facilitators or mediators of the bottom-up knowledge and the logics economically and politically of top top-down urbanization. Because even the activists working in those neighborhoods were not aware of that knowledge. Sure. They are resisting the developers, but they are not representing the knowledge of the community. So there's no, they're not giving them a solution. Exactly. And I think that that's a, a gap that needs to be filled. Uh, it's a difficult issue because it all has to do with, in the end, the amount of profit. Right. I think that enabling housing projects or processes that enable a community to profit from its own infrastructure and its own housing is what we need to talk about. Uh, but yes, in this polarization between the bottom up and the top down, there is much to be said and to be done, really, in producing new models of political representation 
but also community participation. And this is what is absent so it's, from it's, many of those uh, logics. Actually, it's the designer as, as, as facilitator, translator, and mediator. Exactly. That, okay. that is one point that I wish I could have said in the 13 minutes, but it's difficult to do. <laughs> Actually, I'd like to bring in some, we have some yes. people from some large cities around the world. I'd like to bring in some, uh, some commentary. Yes. Um, Nadia, I'm wondering if you have a question for Teddy from Sao Paulo. So based on what we are discussing here, I would like to ask you, how could developers uh, reinvent their business? Are there new ways for them to follow mm. in which they do not provide this kind of uh, valorization of, of the improvements? Is, is there a way that developers could follow to improve their business and bring a good legacy to cities? The answer, in a sense, is that we cannot wait for the developers. They are not our clients. I think that we need to begin by ourselves gaining the knowledge of the developer so that we as designers, as architects, urban planners, become the developers of new housing models because the knowledge is out there to be mobilized. The kind of intelligence that the developer has in manipulating resources and time is all embedded in the spreadsheet. And that knowledge has been away from us. So on one hand, our clients should be ourselves. Second, or primarily in fact, the communities. The, 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 the idea that informal settlements or neighborhoods facilitated by existing community-based practices, whether NGOs or other modes of representation, can in fact also become developers of their own housing. I would argue the examples need to be driven by us and not by the developers. And, and only then they can get a sense. But see, part of the issue in the terms of the urban crisis today is that the resources of the many have been moved to the very few. And I think it's very difficult to convince a developer to have less profit. So that's the reason I think the early stages of transformation would have to happen with very small scale uh, examples and models that can emerge from these communities and so on. But I would argue the importance of architects becoming developers of affordable and social housing in our time. We're going to take another question from Skype. Um, Maddie? Uh, my question is that uh, we are to realize this uh, new way of citizenship where people create rather than just assume. How do we, how do we change people's uh, way of looking at citizenship as something else than just consumers? Mm. Mm. You're getting to the core of the challenge. And that's the reason Latin America, as one of the speakers today suggested, that much more needs to be said about it. What produced the transformation, the urban transformation of some, a place like Medellin, Colombia, that was considered the most dangerous city in the world in the late 80s and early 90s, to becoming now an exemplary model of urban transformation. Again, it was not about buildings, architecture, planning, it was about a political transformation of the institutions, seeking a new type of interface with the public. And in that uh, being said, which is another aspect that many designers, architects, and planners need to engage, how to produce a new civic education, engaging what the Colombians call a civic culture, an urban pedagogy that begins to raise awareness of the relationship of social norms and the construction of the city. I think to re-engage a political will that invests the minds and hearts of people in constructing their own city requires once more mediation and an investment in education particularly. Huge amount of work. But some masochists like you and I, we can engage hopefully in producing new models of interface to produce an urban educational uh, process and I'm very I'm saying that because that's one of the closest projects that I'm that I want to follow in the next years Wonderful. actually I, I want to give the um, people on the panel an opportunity to ask a question who have not spoken yet um, yes um, well I, I come from Bangkok and um, a lot of a lot of what we said seems like uh, we, we need to change a lot of things right but uh, for, for those that are already established especially in the city center where you, you already have like you know all the space are occupied and how do you think the, that area of city could be changed or not? Mm, yes, I think that uh, this is what brings up an issue that was difficult also to elaborate on the 13 minutes, uh, is the role of programming. While certain buildings remain static, fixed, 
that the orientation should be to rethink the retrofitting, not necessarily through physical strategies, but through intelligent programmatic hybrids or conditions that could anticipate the intensification of economic and social activity. So we could be designers, not only of spaces, but of protocols. That's what I was saying earlier. Just like you, you need to own your own cities, like. A sense of ownership of your own city is essential. And that's the reason I think public participation in reforming government is necessary. I, th I feel like uh, you need to come up with an urban handbook for guerrilla warfare in terms of the design space. You know, yes. To give concrete examples of how can we deal with these conditions on a lot of different levels. It's a huge problem, mm -hmm. right? So. And at the end of the day, that's what I'm saying is that we think, because we are educated in architectural schools, that what we need to do as architects is just design sure. objects. Uh, we could be designing many other things. And, and I think that the designing of social relations or even at times political process can be an interesting topic that has been absent from our debate, I think. Right. I want to take one more question from, um, from our viewers on Skype. Um, Sergio, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, one of the things that struck me the most in your talk was when you, when you spoke about the people who were building the, the skate park. Um, and and it, it's, it was interesting to me for two reasons. First, because it, it, it shows that people, that there are people who want to be uh, active in their citizenship. And the, the fact that they were, they were told uh, or they were required to build an NGO. But I see this as something that began as something much more unplanned, something that could grow somewhat more organically. And then it went to an NGO that it, it probably required it to be more planned, more managed, as you say. So are we seeing here two different models? Mm. Would you prefer to have um, some growth that is more unplanned, more, more mm. organic, more typically reactive, because it's not as planned? I get it. And in fact, it's one, of the most, it's, a pro it's, it's one of the most provocative questions. Yes, while we want to protect and uphold the magic of the unplanned, Part of the problem in terms of these communities being suppressed and not able to advance socioeconomically is that they lack representation. They lack at times, not they lack, they, they contain it, but sometimes the instruments to formulate new forms of organization and management that can push against the top-down institution. So I think that I do believe that in order to really get to the next step, the next layer, I think, we need to construct other forms of governance. Now, that's not to say that the skateboarders have to now become rigid and planned. No, they continue to organize themselves by enabling points of access into the magic of the insurgent. But they have now resources. They have now a space that is physical, and they call the shots. And in fact, they are inspiring other environments to do the same. I wouldn't be afraid of that translation from the unplanned into particular calibration of the planned, but without selling out. It is that middle gray zone that needs to be activated because we've been polarizing ourselves based on this way of looking in such, such patronizing way at, 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 at the informal and the unplanned. I think there's much to be constructed there in terms of new politics of urban development. Wonderful. Actually, we're going to have to end there. Actually, we're going to want to get people back into the session. So, Teddy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Some of you, if, if we can keep in touch and invite me to Portugal, uh, <laughs> uh, we, can, we, can, we can have a uh, Thank right. you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, tune back for breaks tomorrow. More of these. Thank you so much. Thank you. Teddy, thank you so much for doing this. Thank fantastic. you. Yes.